Welcome to High Brow Low Brow, the show where our podcast hosts Steve Powell and Dan Slattery pit high art against low culture. In this special episode devoted to the work of Martin Scorsese, we look at two films which have been unjustifiably overlooked in the career of one of the world's greatest directors. Steve's pick is The Age of Innocence, in which Daniel Day-Lewis plays a 19th century lawyer, torn between true love and the expectations of the high society he belongs to. Dan's choice is Bringing Out the Dead, which he argues features Nicolas Cage's greatest performance as a burnt-out paramedic, haunted by the ghost of a patient he failed to save as he drives an ambulance through Hell's Kitchen every night. We hope our choices will drive you back to the more overlooked films in Mr. Scorsese's eclectic career. Beware spoilers and enjoy the show. Well, good evening, dear listener. Welcome to another edition of High Brow, Low Brow. And tonight, it's a Scorsese special, I'm pleased to say. Yes, indeed, we look at two of the many films by Martin Charles Scorsese. Two that maybe haven't got the recognition that they deserve. They may not have crossed your radar, or you may know them already, and they think they warrant further discussion. I'm going to talk about bringing out the dead. But first of all, Steve's going to talk about the age of innocence thank you dan and welcome back dear listeners it's good to be back very much looking forward to this episode about martin scorsese who i think is one of the all-time great film directors yes the age of innocence hasn't necessarily got the same sort of critical attention of other scorsese films but i'm going to make the argument now that it's actually one of his best it is based on a novel by Edith Wharton, and the setting is 1870s New York. The film was made in 1993. Daniel Day-Lewis, here at the height of his powers as an actor, plays Newland Archer, a gentleman in high society, a, a lawyer, upper middle class New York gentleman, who is engaged to a very young lady, Mae Welland. Now, the Welland family is very respectable. Newland Archer is a society lawyer. He's very respectable. They live affluent lives. Uh, I mean, not quite opulent, but certainly very, very comfortable lives. You don't really see the poverty that there would have been in New York in the 1870s because this world is so closed off. You see they move on almost exclusively upper crust circles. So if anything, we see Newland Archer's life and we would envy it. We think he's got a wonderful life. But then there is a complication, a matter of the heart. May's cousin is an heiress, Countess Ellen Alenska, and she's played by Michelle Pfeiffer. And she's recently returned to New York after spending several years living in Europe, where she was married to a Polish count. And everything we are told about this marriage, we never we never meet the Count, uh, is that the marriage was disastrous. As she has returned to New York, this has led her to be ostracized because she wants a divorce, basically. And even though the grounds for divorce that women had at the time, they had very little legal recourse for divorce. She believes uh, she has the grounds for divorce and she's going to go ahead with it. The Countess and Newland developed this very intimate friendship. And at first it's because Newland is just disgusted by his friends who are all snobs, who really look down at Countess Allen, or Colour Allen, because of her status, because life hasn't um, shone on her in quite the same way and with quite the same good fortune that they've had. Newland is, is just disgusted by this. He wants to defend her. He wants to defend her honour. But over time, we realise that his defence of her good name is a little bit more to it than that. He's slowly falling in love with her. It appears that she is falling in love with him, although we only really see her from his viewpoint. And like a lot of these relationships or would-be relationships, there's a lot of guessing, you know, does she like me? Does she not like me? And hanging on her every word and analysing her every word for both good and bad points, he's never entirely sure, at least at the beginning. And this is partly because she is being courted by another man in his circle, um, a married man called Julius Buffo, who's another society snob, I guess, <laughs> a financier. And he's played rather brilliantly by the British actor Stuart Wilson, who's had one of those absolutely fantastic careers. Who's a Perfect actor for highbrow, lowbrow, because he's been in so many great films like Death and the Maiden and The Mask of Zorro. 
you can play the bad guy in Leave a Weapon Free and he's in Hot Fuzz and if, if you like British television he's been in lots of British television productions but he's never quite made the front rank but he's certainly on fine form here as this very louche lascivious upper middle class adulterer and he's courting the Countess so Newland has a rival but he can't really look down on in this rival on moral grounds because although his rival is an adulterer he is engaged to be married to the lovely young May but he begins to feel disillusioned with May because she's so much younger than Alan she's still very innocent in the ways of the world and doesn't have that much life experience and really uh, is portrayed at first as this very naive and which is quite winsome character that he starts to grow contemptuous of. And for a moment, he wants, not quite a quickie wedding, but a, a relatively quick wedding. Possibly he's marrying in haste to rid himself of any doubt. But May insists on a long engagement at her family's insistence as well. And of course, what the families want in this uh, gilded age, uh, the families get. This long engagement means that his love for Alan continues to grow, and so does his torment. Now, I don't want to say too much about the plot because this is not a massively plot-centered drama. It is a character-centered drama, as in how the characters' lives are changing is, is what we're watching here. But it's not as if there's a mystery in the first scene that is resolved by the final scene. Although this being a slightly unusual film for Scorsese to make, there are scenes where they're gossiping and having brandy and cigars. And those scenes are shot almost like mysteries, you know, that they're reading notes that are being delivered at 2 a.m. And the, we just get a glimpse of the text of the notes comes up on the screen. And it is shot like quite a good mystery. But I will say that Newland does marry May and then Alan re-enters his life and begins the whole dilemma again because now he's still in love with Alan and, and now he's a married man. I'm not going to give you a spoil. I'm not going to say how the relationships, the love triangle, if you will, the unrequited love triangle uh, quite resolves itself or quite unravels. But it is a very emotionally raw film. It's about a person going through an emotional crisis and raw emotion in an age where you couldn't show how you were feeling. It was all about veneer and respectability and surface sheen in this world. And here on Britain, we might call it the stiff upper lip mentality. It's very important. In fact, there are a lot of British, Irish uh, actors in this film. I'll just give you a roll call of some of the supporting cast. Miriam Margoyles, who received a BAFTA nomination as a society doyenne, which is very good. Geraldine Chaplin, uh, Michael Goff, uh, Richard E. Grant, Alec McCowan, Sean Phillips, Jonathan Price, actually playing a uh, French writer. The aforementioned Stuart Wilson, who, who I said is on fine form, and so a superb cast, and the film is narrated by Joanne Woodward, who is really just narrating prose from the Edith Wharton novel, but she does it very well because she's almost like the voice of God, or the goddess of high society. So production-wise, it was shot almost entirely on location. In fact, there was only one set constructed for the film, and that was for a, a single scene in a ballroom sequence. The rest of it was shot in a location. The opera scenes were shot at the Philadelphia Academy of Music. It was shot mostly in Troy, New York. It was very well preserved. It built lots of 19th century exteriors and interiors. The script was adapted from the water novel by Scorsese and his collaborator Jay Cox. They'd only worked once together prior to this in a short documentary called Made in Milan, but this was their first full-length collaboration, and they've subsequently gone on to do Gangs of New York and Silence together. But Jay Cox had given Scorsese a copy of the novel back in 1980 and said that this would make a marvellous film and you'd be the perfect person to direct it. It marks something of a turning point in Scorsese's visual sense because he had done... Well, I think if we go for a roll call of Scorsese's films, obviously marvellous, marvellous films, many of them have a kind of bleached, noirish, neo-noir colour, like think uh, Taxi Driver or or even The King of Comedy or or After Hours, because it's all set at night. It's very kind of dark and gloomy and, and, and Goodfellas and New York looks very, very uh, run down and gloomy. Uh, whereas here, the colours are absolutely beautiful. The title sequence was designed by Elaine and Saul Bass and features rosebuds blossoming. And that was done by time-lapse photography. And there's some 
points where Scorsese uses a single color. It might be red for passion, not just romantic passion, but also anger. And the, the red will fill up the screen or yellow. He sends uh, yellow roses. And it is absolutely beautiful to watch. The interiors are absolutely stunning. So it's a beautiful film to watch. And I would say, you know, an emotionally wrenching film, which got really, really good reviews and a handful of Oscar nominations. But I think why many people may have overlooked it in Scorsese's career is that his two previous films were Goodfellas, which was a, a massive hit, and Cape Fear, which I also think did quite well box office-wise. And obviously they're both very violent, exciting, gripping films, and this is quite different in style. They're set a hundred years apart, but really Goodfellas, which is about New York society in the criminal underworld, but it is about that, you know, the working guys at the bottom, the kind of almost aristocratic gangsters at the top. It is about the little rules that exist and also keep this society going. So in some respects, I'd say The Age of Innocence has a lot in common with Goodfellas, especially when you have the characters who are putting things on the line, who are potentially falling out of their society. And it's interesting that how many of Newland's friends, who are probably the worst friends in the world, because they seem to hold him in complete contempt, and they hold many people in contempt, they're just waiting for him to fail. And it seems like this is a very unforgiving world. But aside from the really good reviews, there were a few dissenting voices, like Mark Savlov in the Austin Chronicle, who called the film painfully wearisome, society functions and banter, with an indecisive little newt of a protagonist. And to be fair, you do see um, Daniel Day-Lewis emotionally suffering a lot in this film. If you don't like him, if you have no sympathy for his dilemma, then you might struggle. But if you do have sympathy, his performance really carries you through and you're really going to empathise with him. I read in an interview years ago that Scorsese um, took the bad reviews to heart and decided that his next film was going to be Casino, where, you know, another gangster film, a return to form. And Olo Casino, which I think is a great film, also got some great reviews. It also got a bunch of bad reviews who said, oh, it's just a good fella's rip-off. Why is he repeating himself? And that's when Scorsese, he said he decided, like, you cannot win with critics. I'm not going to make the films critics want me to make. I'm going to make my own. So that was an interesting turning point. And again, although you wouldn't think Casino has much in common with The Age of Innocence, visually it, what it has because Scorsese once again embraced the colour the colour palette of Casino is very bright and visual and it is to reflect the gaudy Las Vegas style of the fluorescent lights and show tunes style, obviously with a lot of violence behind it. In a diverse and wonderful career where he's made some wonderful films, some very good films, and I think very few outright failures of, of films. I certainly can't think of many. The Age of Innocence, I think, is one of his best. It is just a beautiful film. I've returned to it a few times, and it was a pleasure to rewatch it for this podcast. I don't know much about other Edith Wharton adaptations. I did see the Terence Davis adaptation of House of Murph with Gillian Anderson, which I thought was good. I thought it was a fine film, but that one I thought was too harsh, too unforgiving. There was no redemption to it, and uh, it left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. So with this one, I can watch it and still feel it's heartrending, but it's also about the choices we make and how there's solace in each one. Because really, it boils down to Newland has one of two options. Whichever option, whichever choice he makes for his life, he's going to experience pain or loss. But he also experiences love and beauty, and it is a beautiful film, The Age of Innocence. I recommend it to you as my highbrow choice of the week. Good effort, dear boy. Well, well done. I remember at the time giving it a swerve because I thought, oh, this is Martin Scorsese doing Merchant Ivory. But then when I watched it this time around, I thought, well, there's certain Merchant Ivoryisms in it, but there's certain Martin Scorseseisms in it as well. So I think it's quite diplomatic to say if you like your Merchant Ivory, then I think you'll enjoy it. There's a lot to get out of this in a positive sense. And if you don't like Merchant Ivory, it's not a complete Merchant Ivory ripoff. So you'll be fine if you're coming at it from a Scorsese perspective. I really enjoyed his opulent use of colour, the smooth camera moves, the set design, the tail itself, I thought worked very well. I'm not a huge period piece kind of person. But I enjoyed this a lot. And it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's uh, I think it's just short of two hours, isn't it? Well, actually, it's two hours, 20 minutes. It doesn't feel like... I mean, some of his recent films, like The Irishman, was four hours. It felt like four Ooh. weeks. 
the same with Kills of the Flower Moon, which was four hours and was a bit of a slog. But yeah, I think this one is, is quite trim and nice and lean at two hours, 20 minutes. At first, I thought, oh, this is um, a British effort because of the number of um, British actors in it, like Richard E. Grant, for example, as well, Daniel Day-Lewis, the aforementioned Miriam Margulies. I enjoyed it as a film, and I thought it looked very well, some lovely camera work. The only thing that jarred with me was his use of Enya singing Marble Halls, which is a lovely recording, and I would recommend it to anyone, but I just thought he's got a traditional orchestral score, and then this more modernist thing creeps in. And it's well-placed, but I just thought it's the only instance of this in an otherwise orchestral score, and for that, it jarred with me. But then one of the things I've learned through watching this and also bringing out the dead is that Martin loves his music, and he, his scores can be quite eclectic. Sometimes the choices that you think jar at the time, actually, when you look back at them, make perfect sense. So maybe I shouldn't be so harsh on that aspect of the film. I suppose the particular track you mention, which I don't think I've heard outside of this film, but the snippet of it in the film I, I certainly liked. I think I'll, I'll have to listen to the whole thing. Maybe it fell out of place because the, the rest of it you're listening to opera that the characters would have been listening to. and It's not one of those kind of funky, it's definitely not like a steampunky production. Maybe it fell out of place in that regard. If there'd been more bits of music like that, interspersed throughout the score it would have made more sense to me but then it, it just works that just seems to be a, a trend in Scorsese movies he just puts in whatever music he thinks will work and regardless of its origin or timing or anything like that fair play to him if that's the way he makes movies Tarantino mashes up his scores all over the place so I suppose why not <laughs> you know no hard and fast rules to these things did you feel much sympathy for Newland? oh I did absolutely like you say, the two choices, which one is the right choice, the one that does right by everybody else or the one that does right by him? What came across very well was the repression of the era. In this day and age, obviously, an extramarital affair would still cause ructions, but this is at a time where an extramarital affair made your societal pariah. It was a really, really looked down on, and the amount of damage that the revelation of such or even the hint of it would cause came across really well and that he was putting himself and his family in jeopardy. Whatever choice he made would be major and would have repercussions either for him or for his family. Rewatching it this time, I was struck when the Countess, she finds she does have the legal grounds for divorce, but he talks her out of it because he's like, well, legally you may, but still the societal damage, the damage to your reputation outside of the courtroom would be massive when he kind of puts the kibosh on one thing that would set her free, we see how lopsided it is. It's skewered to be a man's world. Because even when they said, oh, we've got the most liberal divorce laws in the world, it doesn't really mean a thing and because of the society set that they're in. Watching this, I was minded of Thomas Hardy adaptations like Jude the Obscure and things like that, which really tap into what a big thing extramarital affairs were at the time. That came across very well. The way that both Michelle Pfeiffer and Daniel Day-Lewis are able to show repressed emotions, this love of which they dare not speak, very well. Their ability to display that almost less is more school of acting. It's what they're not showing you rather than what they are showing you that's important is very impressive. Steve, as, as an actor, how does one convey repression? I mean, you're basically not showing somebody. You're trying to convey something by not showing them something. How do you do that? I have to say that my acting was limited to the theatre, where it's probably even harder. I never did anything like Rattigan or that. We tended to do bigger productions where you really had to convey to the, the person at the back of the room. And it was an interesting experience for me because I'd been brought up on films. I tried to bring my own experience of, you know, repressed emotions to it. And the director's just like, no, it, it doesn't work like that. You've, you've got to project everything. It was, you know, projection, projection, projection. You know, my dalliance in acting was limited to the theatre. So I never really got to play scenes like this, which I would have absolutely loved to have done because it is just beautiful acting. You know, I believe Day-Lewis's technique is very much method and that he'd be in character on set all day. You know, he's not joking around in between takes. He would be Newland all day, so he would be pent up, stiff, terse. It's interesting that Winona Ryder was the only member of the cast who got an Oscar nomination because I was reading through some of the reviews. We find out towards the end that she knows a lot more than she's let on, as she's come across as very naive. And there was even one review I read that almost portrayed her as this lady named Beth, that she's been controlling Newland 
almost from the start and managed to win him over and managed to always keep him through pure manipulation right from the start, which I didn't quite buy, but I was very much interested in her journey because she's giggly and, and girly and he looks down on her. We don't realize she's got almost everything she wants out of the film <laughs> and she's managed to live with the pain of almost adultery. Newland certainly goes too far. I don't want to say more before I give something away, but uh, it is a, it is a wonderful film. And on to your choice, I think now, Dan. Well, thank you, Steve. My choice is the 1999 film Bringing Out the Dead. Now, between The Age of Innocence and Bringing Out the Dead, Scorsese had gone on to make, as Steve mentioned, Casino. He'd then gone on to make Gundam, which divided the critics even more. Whether this was subconsciously or consciously an attempt to get back to what he did best, I don't know. But Bringing Out the Dead reunited him with uh, Paul Schrader, who, of course, he'd worked with on Taxi Driver and Raging Bull. And it's based on a novel of the same name by a chap called Joe Connolly. Now, before I talk about the movie, let's talk a bit about Mr. Connolly, because this novel is autobiographical. Connolly was born in St. Clair's Hospital in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. And after dropping out of college and reading a book called The Razor's Edge by Somerset Mon, he decided to become an ambulance driver in Hell's Kitchen. Now, if your geography is as terrible as mine, it might help you to know that Hell's Kitchen is the area that surrounds Times Square and is one of the most run down and busy in New York. He worked in Harlem first, where they encountered a system which was, as it is today, overrun. Ambulance broken to cages to get to places. People were always angry. The emergency room was like a revolving door for some people. In 1987, people just got a medal for turning up. Then he moved on to working in Hell's Kitchen. And this was around the time of the AIDS epidemic and the crack epidemic as well. So he started writing about what he was seeing. He went to a night writing class and this gradually coalesced into a novel which got published in 1998 and the film rights were bought for $100,000 and then the film came out in 1999. The character in the film is called Frank Pierce, but he may well has be, be called Joe Connolly because what you're watching is pretty much what happens to Joe in real life. And if, like any book, there are elements in the book that didn't make it into the film. At one point, the book was 500 pages long which would have made for a very long movie. So although he's not given a, a scripting credit, he did work with Paul Schrader on the screenplay and he was on set advising when the film was being shot on location in Hell's Kitchen. The film is about a paramedic called Frank Pierce, who's played by Nicolas Cage, and he's suffering from all sorts. He's depression, he's not sleeping, he's got what they call occupational burnout, which means he's just getting tired of doing the job. He keeps hallucinating about a teenage homeless girl that he failed to save called Rose. One of the things you'll notice is as the film goes on, he starts to see her more and more. He's just hallucinating her everywhere he goes. He's paired with other drivers. The first one he's with is a guy called Larry, who's played by John Goodman. And he's very much by the book, very serious. They respond to a call for a family, a guy called Mr. Burke, who's just gone into cardiac arrest. Frank meets his daughter, Mary, who's played by Patricia Arquette, and they form a bond. You start to see certain characters who will reappear and you gradually get introduced to them. In fact, one of the other people you meet is this drug addict called Noel, who's constantly thirsty, but he has a condition where if he drinks too much water, that will cause him damage. But he pops up again and again. So when they're taking Mr. Burke to hospital, he's talking to Mary. She was a former junkie, it turns out. They go to a hospital, I think it's called Our Lady of Mercy, but they know it as Misery Hospital. And it's quite ironic in that these some of these hospitals with what, what sounds like very holy religious names turn out to be hell on earth. This hospital, they are almost told to take the patient away because they can't take any more in. There's one unintentionally funny bit where there's a guy stationed by the entrance door whose foot keeps getting banged every time the, the door opens. And then Noel keeps screaming for a cup of water and somebody else shouts at him to shut up. And the place is just overrun with overworked medics and it's almost comical. And the thing is, having been in some accident and emergency places on Saturday night, stroke Sunday morning, you just think it's so real, it's uncanny. It really isn't a place you want to be. And this hospital really isn't a place anybody wants to be. Nicholas basically needs a good night's sleep. His character is trying to get himself sacked. And this is another thing which is comic. He keeps 
turning up late to shifts and he goes to see his boss and he says to him, I thought if I turned up late for another shift, you'll sack me. And his boss is so short staffed, he can't sack him. So he says to him, come back at the end of the week and then I'll sack you, which is just a whole darkly comic thing. Frank's shifts go on. And while he's dealing with these things, there's this new type of heroin called Red Death. And there seems to be an epidemic of that, which obviously ties into the real life crack epidemic that Connolly had to deal with. And whenever they're dealing with the drug victim, he's dying in the back of the ambulance. And as they treat him, some vials of Red Death roll out of his hand. He also meets this other ambulance driver called Marcus, who's played by Ving Rames, who's quite religious. And there's one comic sequence in this where they go to a nightclub where somebody's had a heart attack due to what turns out to be a heroin overdose. His stage name is I.B. Bangin, but his real name is Frederick. So obviously he wants to be known by I.B. Bangin. While Frank injects the man with a substance called Narcan, which apparently helps with heroin overdoses, Marcus leads the rest of the band and the concert goers in a fervent circle of prayer. And as I.B. Bangin revives, you know, Marcus gives thanks to Jesus for doing this, whereas, of course, his medicine did the hard work. Marcus is just this over-the-top, cigar-smoking, shameless character who has this relationship with one of the dispatchers called Love, who's voiced by Queen Latifah, and he is one of the more funny aspects of this movie. When you watch this, you think, oh, this none of this could be real. But in fact, when you realize some of the things they have to put up with, you think some of this must be real because it's the only coping mechanism these people have is just to laugh through these situations. As Frank is going to these different call-outs, he is, of course, interacting with Noel again and with Mary again. He then starts hallucinating that her father, who keeps getting brought back to life because the family won't put a do not resuscitate order on him, he starts hallucinating then that Mr. Burke is communicating with him and telling him, don't resuscitate me, don't resuscitate me. So he seems to be recovering, but Frank seems to be detecting from him that he doesn't want to be brought back to life. There is one sequence where Frank goes to see a drug dealer because he's trying to find where Mary has gone. And the dealer gives him something and he hallucinates a sequence where he remembers trying to save Rose. And an interesting thing about that is the snow is falling upward. So obviously the scene has been filmed in reverse now, whereas nowadays you would be able just to film a scene and put in, using CGI, reverse snow. This, of course, was filmed in 99 when you couldn't do things like that. So the whole scene was filmed in reverse. And a quick bit of insider knowledge, basically the actors recorded their lines and then what they're doing is lip syncing to reversed playback of the lines. So it's actually snowing. They're speaking in reverse and therefore when the whole film is then run the, the right in inverted commas way. It's a very effective scene. As the three-night shift goes on and he's not sleeping, everything takes on an even more aura and glow around it. The whole colour palette compared to the Age of Innocence is completely washed out. And Frank starts off looking like he's got panda eyes and just goes downhill from there. As he has less and less sleep, just everything has a glow to it. And if you've ever been sleep-deprived, you just know how things seem to have this unearthly glow around them. And how sometimes you just seem to black out and characters seem to jump. It conveys that really well. So as the film goes on, he does discover more about this new Red Death heroin, and he does follow Mr. Burke's recovery, and he does get to know more about Mary. But in the same way that Taxi Driver isn't a film about driving a taxi, this isn't a film about driving an ambulance as such, but it's about finding forgiveness. Frank is constantly punishing himself. He's remembering this one life that he couldn't save. And there are other lives that he doesn't save, but it's just one one that always haunts him. And I think with Mary, he's trying to seek some kind of redemption through that, that maybe if he can save a life, all will be well. And really, all he needs is a good night's sleep. Now, like anything that Paul Schrader has done, there's a very kind of spiritual aspect to it. If you see one of the trailers, it's marketed as this pedal to the metal driving an ambulance around Hell's Kitchen. You know, will they make it in the nick of time? It's not like that at all. And in fact, the editor of the film, who I believe is... Scorsese's regular editor, Thelma Schoonmaker, felt that the film was missold by one of the trailers which portrayed it as a car chase movie, and it's not. If you've seen any Paul Schrader, then you'll know what to expect with this. It's more about human redemption. It's about finding oneself. Can Frank save himself through saving others? 
I don't dislike Scorsese, but I'm not a Scorsese fan in that, you know, I, w- I would go and see a film because it's a Scorsese film. So this one completely passed me by in the cinema. And it was only when I watched it late one night on ITV, I thought, why didn't I see this? Because this is brilliant. And I really enjoyed it. Now, the critics loved it, but the box office didn't. It made back 16.8 million on a budget of 32 million. And I think the miss selling of it in the trailer didn't help. The fact that Scorsese's commercial appeal wasn't at its height. The fact that it's such a dark topic, and it is a dark topic, but there are moments of humour in it. The camera work is great, the way the camera zooms in and out of things. Scorsese plays with time perception as well. At one point, the film speeds up and slows down. Oh, I should talk about the third ambulance driver that Frank's paired with. That would be Tom Walls, played by Tom Sizemore, who just seems to be playing himself, really. When a man like Tom is worried about Frank, then Frank is obviously in a bad way. It does come across what the stress and the restrictions that they're working under and how they want to feel sympathy for these characters, but sometimes it's very difficult because really they're their own worst enemies. At one point, he's dealing with a drug dealer impaled on some railings, and of course, there's a conflicting loyalties there. I mean, he's a drug dealer, but does he want to save his life? It's an interesting score. Elmer Bernstein contributes a good score, but there's a lot of music through it. There's a bit of Van Morrison, a bit of R.E.M., a bit of The Who on the radio. I enjoyed it because for the same reason why I liked After Hours, if you remember that episode, that I liked Cities at Night. It's mostly set at night. In fact, the scenes for me set during the daytime jarred a lot. I just like the way Scorsese seems to be very good at knowing the streets of New York, finding the absolute real scuzzy bits of it, getting into the characters. I mean, these are obviously the streets you grew up in. These are the streets that Joe Joe Connolly worked on. And it all comes across in this, that meeting these characters, how true to life it is. For me, it's a shame that it hasn't done well. And it's one of Scorsese's films that hasn't had a re-release in recent years. It hasn't made it onto Blu-ray. Nicolas Cage, in a Rolling Stone interview in 2022, reckons it's one of the best films he's ever made. And I'd be inclined to agree with that. And I think it's one of the most underappreciated Scorsese films. That's what Thelma Schoonmaker says, and I'd agree with her on that as well. And if it hasn't crossed your radar, then I would certainly recommend you go out and try and find it. Right, Steve, I think I've banged on long enough. What did you Uh, make of it? Well, firstly, that was a very good recommendation overview. You really tapped into some of the key themes there. I liked the film. I don't think I quite liked it, perhaps, as much as you did. There were one or two moments when I was very much like, well, this rings true. But there were also moments where I was just like, I know it's based on a novel, but a novel of experience. There were one or two moments where I was just like, this couldn't have happened, surely. I would be interested to read the novel and read about the novelist's experiences, particularly the scene that you mentioned with I.B. Banging. I just watched that and thought, no paramedic could get away with doing that. Personally, that's where it threw me out the story a bit. I was starting to think of it as the satire in the vein of, say, um, the George C. Scott film, The Hospital, which is kind of similar to this one set in New York at this horrible rundown hospital where everyone's become cynical. You know, they've gone into medicine to save lives, but now they're worn down and wary. Yeah, the Tom Sizemore character, he is pretty much a psychotic, isn't he? Uh, He's addicted to trauma, so it's kind of amusing, but it's also really disturbing that he wants to go to the shootings and he wants to go to the crime scenes because he's basically a psychopath and he's addicted to blood and guts, which I thought was interesting and I felt like it's probably just an exaggeration of the way one or two paramedics go. I mean, some of them must lose their mind. I thought that was interesting. And then, well, the drug addict who can't drink too much water and Tom Sizemore is going to kill this guy. He's going to murder him. That's where I was just like, it lost a bit of realism to me. But, you know, Nicolas Cage manages to save him. I liked it. Like I say, it didn't quite work for me. I'd say maybe it's kind of mid-range Scorsese, but I don't know what low range is. Maybe some of his more recent four-hour efforts have been a bit, oh no, a bit of a slog. I did prefer this. I was wondering what Nicolas Cage would have thought of it. It just demanded a lot of him, the role. He looks awful. He looks like he should be in the back of the ambulance, you know. He's basically halfway to being a patient, and the system is so overrun that they just keep him going, even though they know they're slowly killing him. I just want to give a quick shout out to the Medic Up podcast, because that was where I got a lot of information about Joe Connolly, because Wikipedia, uh, I don't know, Google searches are rather woeful about Connolly, what happened after the movie was made, and I discovered this podcast called Medic Up, and one episode, or in fact two episodes, are an interview with Joe Connolly. 
And it's very good as a podcast anyway, if you're interested in the work of the emergency medical services in the US and elsewhere. He was saying it was originally Tom Cruise was touted. I mean, I think that was when Tom Cruise would have been in everything. But it was a conversation with Brian De Palma, who had cast Nicolas Cage in Snake Eyes, that made Scorsese approach Cage for the role. And I couldn't see Tom Cruise do that, to be honest. I think Cage, that role was made for him. And he looks, if it's possible to say this, Steve, he looks awful so well. <laughs> yeah, I think Tom Cruise slumming it, you're looking at like Jerry Maguire. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because that's where you see Tom Cruise, his character hits this big career low, but he always looks fantastic, you know, whereas this Nicolas Cage, he, he really just embraces every little aspect of the character's downfall. You don't for a second not believe Cage in that role. There were one or two bits, Ving Rhames' driving was just awful. If you look at Ving Rhames, where he's behind the ambulance, you used to see in old movies where they're holding the steering wheel and the, the hands are going up and down and up and down and up and down. That car would be swerving everywhere. I noticed Ving Rhames was doing that and it was a bit distracting. But no, I mean, I broadly liked it. I, I did like it. I'm not sure I'd watch it again. And like you said, and I said of Age of Innocence, it's probably closer to a lot of Scorsese's themes than you might at first appreciate why it's gone unnoticed is a bit of a crime. Maybe it was because not being on a critical high, having done Casino and then Condon, maybe people just thought, oh, Scorsese, Nicholas Cage, an ambulance driver. How dull, but being missold by the marketing people as well. With a man who's had a career as long as Scorsese, obviously there's going to be a few that are absolute duds and a few that are great that have, for whatever reason, been criminally overlooked. And I would certainly place both of our choices in the latter category. I certainly would put Bringing Out the Dead as one of his better films and one certainly ripe for discovery or reappraisal. And I would love to see it get a proper Blu-ray release with, like, you know, behind the scenes or making of or interviews and things like that that they usually put on. It just seems to be the one that has been ignored. I wasn't able to find anything about Scorsese's view on it. Like I say, there was a Rolling Stone interview with Cage from 2022 where he liked it. Oh, Roger Ebert as well gave it the perfect four-star rating and the interesting quote this, to look at bringing out the dead, to look indeed at almost any Scorsese film is to be reminded that film can touch us urgently and deeply. Well, as you've mentioned his later ones, but I'm just looking at his earlier stuff. Are there any others that you think are absolute clunkers? I was going to ask you a really similar question, but my question was kind of flipping it around to say, are there any other really underrated Scorsese ones? To answer your question, I haven't seen all of them. I haven't seen some of the very early ones, like Boxcar Bertha, which I think he's practically disowned. I haven't seen Alice Doesn't Live Here anymore, which I know some people really rate. Oh, yeah, I didn't like New York, New York. In fact, I don't even think I got to the end of it. Okay, that's, because I just don't think musical is his natural medium. But Liza Minnelli was very good in it, and De Niro was good, although not his best. It just didn't work, and again, it was a long one. Sometimes his longer films don't work. Uh, so I'd put New York, New York as an honourable failure. To flip it around and answer my own question, I think King of Comedy is just brilliant. And that one, I remember Scorsese said, it got such bad reviews at the time that he actually was plunged into this deep depression. It, it made some critics' worst films of the year list, and now its reputation has completely flipped around, and some people say it's one of his best. Maybe worthwhile of a future episode of Highbrow Labor, who knows? But anyway, those are, those are my two picks. How about you? I wanted to like The Colour of Money because I like The Hustler, and for some reason, something in The Colour of Money just didn't connect with me, and I don't know what it was. I think I need to watch it again. But then I suppose making a sequel to a film as iconic as The Hustler, you've got your work cut out for you. The Last Temptation of Christ I thought was interesting. It's certainly worth a watch. It's not as controversial as history would kind of have you believe. I mean, it was a bit of a storm in the teacup at the time. It's an interesting watch. I mean, After Hours we've covered and enjoyed After Hours. And as much as I spotted the twist in Shutter Island pretty early on, I really enjoyed Shutter Island as a film. I don't know why. Do you know something? I just couldn't get into Casino. I wanted to like Casino, and for whatever reason, I don't know why, but just didn't resonate with me at all. And I know that's such an awful, awful answer, but I just thought, I don't know why I'm not getting more out of this, because it seems to be well made, or maybe I was just expecting another good fellas and I wasn't getting it. I don't know. But Casino, for me, was a bit of a misfire. Yeah, I mean, I, I really liked it at the time, and I felt like it's kind of two movies, because 
again, it's a long one, it's three hours. And the first two hours are really just a documentary where you're looking at how the casinos are run by the mob and just the function of the casinos, you know, how the card tables work, how the slot machines work. And the plot doesn't kick in till the last hour. But if you can buy that, I'm not sure if I could review it now because a lot of the murders you see in Casino were later solved by the FBI after the film came out. Nothing to do with the film, but after the film came out, there was an FBI operation called Operation Family Secrets where they finally solved a lot of those murders and they were nothing like how Casino portrays them, which is fine because it's a movie. So I'm not sure I could revisit that one. I liked The Departed, and when I first saw it, I really liked it, but then I rewatched Infernal Affairs, and I just thought, this is better. It's leaner, it's sleeker, there's no fat on it. But, you know, The Departed is fine, and that's the one that finally won him the Oscar, which many people felt was long overdue. Maybe it was just a case of, oh dear, we really haven't. So <laughs> It's absurd that we haven't given Scorsese an Oscar. We've got to give him one for something quick. Couldn't watch Hugo gave up on it. If I can't get to the end of it, that's not a good sign. Hugo did nothing for me. Oh, well. But he's still got plenty of good ones. So he's, he's almost like Michael Caine in his approach, really, isn't he? There's plenty of great ones, plenty of good ones, some mid-table ones and a couple of flunkers. And hopefully still many more to come. I believe he's doing another film about the life of Jesus. You were talking about a storm in a teacup, Dan, but this one might have a contemporary setting. But I've only read snippets so far, and the pre-publicity has been a bit cagey. I don't think it's even started shooting yet, so who knows? It might turn out completely differently. But if he's, he's returning to overt religious themes, I don't know. It could be great, it could be not so great, but um, we shall see. Oh, one I would recommend, one of his documentaries, is the George Harrison one, Living in the Material World. It's very good. I mean, and I'm speaking as a George Harrison fan. I'd bought that and hadn't, for whatever reason, hadn't got around to watching it. Watched it recently, and it's very good. And I believe his No Direction Home about Bob Dylan is also worth a watch as well. Completely forgot about his documentaries. I think we've name checked at least most of the films. I can't think of any others that really stand out. Oh, here's one. It's a short film from 1963. It's called What's a Nice Girl Like You Doing in a Place Like This? So there you are. Hey, yeah. Well, thank you, dear listener. We hope you've enjoyed the films we've picked and our discussion of them in this uh, Martin Scorsese special. The Age of Innocence and Bringing Out the Dead. Now, if you're a Scorsese fan or you're even moderately interested in the work of Martin Scorsese, I think you should check out these films if you haven't already seen them. Uh, we've very much enjoyed talking about them. We love to dig out some of the unappreciated or perhaps forgotten films of their era, so it's been an absolute pleasure to do it for this one. And we'll be back soon with two more Overlooked films that we will just uh, love putting on your radar. So we'll see you then. Goodbye for now. You've been listening to Highbrow Lowbrow, presented by Steve Pyle and Dan Slattery. We'd love to hear from you, and you can contact us by going to our link tree. That's linkpr.ee forward slash highbrow lowbrow. Until next time, keep it highbrow and lowbrow.